So you, you mentioned that you were with Willie for a while and uh, you were you wanted to share some of those experiences and, and uh, I'm, I'm very interested to hear them. Well, you know, there were a couple of couple of things that were interesting. And I, when I first found the two of you, uh, it, it really cracked me up because when you were just a little puppy, I used to... <laughs> I used to show up during uh, the one or two major town celebrations that you would have, and I would sit uh, with binoculars and watch the kids on the little train putting around town. And, and of course, you know, you, you really couldn't ever go anywhere without being under surveillance. But it was really frustrating for Willie's band of uh, men <laughs> to do much about a police officer sitting there. I mean, I'd come in in an unmarked car that had antennas on and There was no question that, you know, <laughs> number one, you don't belong in the neighborhood. And, uh, and then you, you know, you walk into the grocery store or something with a badge and a gun on it, it, it sends a pretty clear message. And you know that within minutes of coming into town that you're under surveillance, but uh, I wanted to know about some of those things. Uh, I wanted to know about the camera infrastructure. And uh, and we would use, uh, when I was a young SWAT officer, tactics for tailing people. Uh, and I would, and so it was always fun for me because I'd come into town and I'd see those same tactics that had been trained when I was a young SWAT officer being deployed on me somebody following me for a block while somebody else catches me on the next street and it's like <laughs> and, you know and and uh it was always a pickup truck with some big burly guy in it that that uh, you know followed you around um but that was one of the things i wanted to know is i wanted to know about the camera infrastructure and and frankly how uh, the community was able to afford a camera infrastructure that was as sophisticated as it was. And, and I don't know what your knowledge of that was as a kid, but um, you talk about today what a city might have in a camera infrastructure. You go back to the early 90s and think about a community that was deploying those kinds of technologies. That's not a normal community. Right. No. no. No, we knew there were cameras, and we, we, uh, we spotted a few around the community as far as, in trees and, and that type of thing and on the on the, the lamp or the the power line posts and uh some of the the big compounds or walls around the community would have cameras on those walls and uh there are a lot of cameras that i didn't know about uh that i learned about later but you 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 could kind of feel that you there was there was always an eye watching you somehow or another and uh it just felt that way, uh, and, and maybe maybe it wasn't always the case, but around the community, we didn't feel that we could really run off and do our own thing without being noticed. So there you go, and isn't that a, a powerfully intimidating capability that the leaders had over everyone else? Is all I've got to do is get you to believe that the three cameras you can see exist and are being monitored. And then somebody tells me there are a hundred more that you can't see. And right. uh, what a great way to get compliance. Well, and then of course they would use some of this information that they would gather, use it as revelation. They would say, Oh, God revealed that you did such and such and such. And then we were like, Whoa, there's no way they could have known that. So they must be receiving this directly from God. How did they so, know that I kissed Farmer Johnson's daughter behind the elk pen? How did they know? <laughs> yeah, you I go. Mean, yeah, 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 you combine you combine the actual physical surveillance with the mentality that these men could read your minds. I mean, Sam had experiences where they would put the young boys in a room and they would just like look into their eyes and be, basically say that they know what they had done until they would confess. So you add those two tactics and it's like, that's just a lot of fear yeah. as a child. Sitting in that same town hall that, uh, that you mentioned in that same building, uh, we were all questioned all me and the several of my brothers, if we had been doing certain things and uh, they would ask us questions that very likely all of the young men were, were doing. <laughs> But, but of course it came across as they, they knew somehow they knew that we were doing these things. And anyway, it, it was uh, very interesting. They used a lot of tactics to keep us in line and to keep us believing that they were 
that they were receiving revelation somehow. So, well, and somehow they were um, very successful. And I'd like you to maybe speak to this for just a moment, Sam. But they were very successful in getting you to snitch on each other. Yes, yes. Uh, we felt that we we felt that we had an obligation that if we saw something, we said something. And uh, I think a lot of that was because we assumed that if we saw something, God saw something. And so if we didn't say anything about it, then we were also in the wrong. And we were, in fact, they would say things like, if you see something, even if you weren't a part of it and don't say anything about it, you are just as bad, just as guilty as the person that did it because you didn't say anything about it. So <laughs> they would use tactics like that, that we felt that we had to. Yeah, I've had some of Sam's sisters have mentioned too, and like the the women that we've interviewed before, talking about that same where like if you want to, it's another way to earn favor. So in addition to like the fear of um, like not having favor, you can also do things to lift your favor up, right? Like to be more favorable. And so, yeah, kind of snitching is a way to be able to raise up your status as well, proving that. Not only are you doing what's right, but you're making sure that everybody else is around you. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. You know, uh, one of the other things that uh, Willie and I spent a lot of time talking about was uh, the marking over the doors or over gates that provided either <coughs> a safe haven or a... Uh, a public statement of how worthy this little family was. Why don't you share kind of the, your the, memories the, the, of that? The, the, Zion. the Zion, is that correct? The, yes. the word Zion, yes. Yeah. So interestingly, those markings were not put on any of the homes when I was out there. So this was something that happened after the fact. And after Warren's arrest. Yes, after Warren's arrest and after I had moved out, I would say this, these, this type of thing started happening in about 2010, 2011. And that, at that time, a lot of the church members were being split apart. There were some that were worthy enough to be members and others that weren't worthy enough. And so some were being rebaptized and being claimed to be the good members. And the others would have to live in different parts of the home. And it was a whole mess. And it was at that moment, I believe, and it seemed that people started putting the, the, the word Zion above their doors, meaning this is a true member, true follower um, home uh, to kind of uh, as kind of a, like you said, a public statement that uh, we are the good families in the community. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's kind of that's kind of what it seemed like. But but the actual word Zion was uh, in their mind. Uh, a, a place that everyone should be striving for and a state of mind of perfection that everyone should be striving for uh, that will be a place that, that Jesus Christ can return and, and everyone that is righteous enough can be there with him. And there, there are multiple sets of different like baptisms. So um, one of his cousins that had uh, stayed with us for a while, she, she said, you know, after he was um, incarcerated after Warren was, She's like, so then they had the order and then there was the restoral order and then there was like the true restoral order. So I think she said that um, post him being imprisoned, she had been baptized as a girl like one or two more times. And then by that time, she was like kind of done with it and she ended up leaving. But the constant like rebaptism of the most elite and then the most elite and then the most elite um, continued onward. So there was always something there was always something more that you should be striving for. Um, to get as close as you could to the idea of perfection. And yeah, they wanted to always keep them trying to be better uh, and to feel that they weren't good enough. So they had to try being more obedient, trying to do these things. It was also a very easy way to say, to tell the community, hey, these prophecies that we have promised would happen aren't happening because too many members of this community just aren't, they're not good enough. And so I, I think there was a lot of reasons for it, but uh, just just to hold that power over people's head uh, is you would think that it would make them run. But the, it seems that the more power they have over these people, the more they want to stick to it and prove that they can that they can be good enough. So it's, it's interesting how that works. Yeah. But, it, 
I mean, isn't that isn't that crazy? And, and you and to go back and think, um, like 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 I don't know that I believe that John Barlow wanted this wacky end to happen the way it did. Um, I don't know that Rulin wanted things to go the way they ended up. Always wanted polygamy. Always wanted plural marriage. Um, but when Warren came on the scene, that's when things really got wacky. You oh, yeah. always had violation of the law. <coughs> yes. Yes. But uh, yeah. that's when things got but wacky. Warren, <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. But Warren, he wanted he wanted it all. He wanted all the power. He wanted all the say. He wanted all the money. He wanted all the, all, wives. All the wives. He wanted all the businesses. He just wanted everything. And so it came to a point where he was destroying. It didn't take him long to just destroy the community, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, just ripping apart families and, and, and selling businesses to take the money and forcing people out of their livelihoods. And it just ah, time after time. And, and, and all of these, this time that he was taking money from people, he was off doing things, which at this point, at this point, I had no idea, but he was off doing things that he was, preaching against doing over the pulpit and and there we were giving him his money to be able to do these things and it just it just it's infuriating now to me the, the difference is for him it was under the instruction of god to understand things i mean that's how these wacky guys always pull it off is i don't want to do this but i don't want to offend god but uh, here's the standard for you which is just plain malarkey um i i get so frustrated. Now, the other thing that I really uh, wanted to spend some time with Willie on was uh, not only a little bit of time in the traditional cemetery uh, where some of the previous prophets had been buried and other kinds of things, but I was mostly interested in the baby cemetery because of uh, the ghost stories surrounding, again, those children. Not not that children were being murdered, but that there, there clearly was uh, because of all of the incestuous relationships, there there are, are statistics out there that bear up and support that there were uh, birth abnormalities and <coughs> um, and handicaps and other things that came from all of the inbreeding that was occurring higher right. than anywhere in the world. So that's that's just a hard fact that whether people there like it or not, they have to to deal with. But um, I, I was really troubled again by the little ones who either died because of birth defects or for some other reason that were disposed of without ever having a birth certificate or a death certificate. Can you, what can you speak to in that so, regard? Yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you the only thing I know about that or what I was told about that uh, cemetery, the, the, the baby's cemetery is what we would call it. And that is that uh, I don't know much about the babies that didn't have a birth certificate or that i'm not sure about that but what i do know is that it was a cemetery for those children that died under the age of eight because we were told that children under the age of eight were perfect because they were too young to know what they were doing so they could commit no sin so if i remember correctly it was something about their resurrection would be different so they were put in their own cemetery because they were perfect children, never had any chance to do anything wrong in this life. No, and, so, and so they would immediately be able to return and live with Heavenly Father without any judgment. And uh, so they have their own place to be buried. That's what I was told. Beyond that, uh, I would just be guessing. Yeah, I've definitely heard ghost stories and stuff as well. And I've never, we've never been able to find anybody that um, can give any more insight on that. So if somebody is listening and they have more insight on that, <laughs> please, please yes. comment, <laughs> reach out. We'd love to hear from you because yeah, I'd like. Yeah, to there's just not, well. there's just not a lot of information about that. And yeah, we've yeah. never, we've only really heard the ghost stories that really can't be um, like validated, I guess. Or yeah, but I do know that there were a lot of. Uh, I don't know the statistics if it was a lot more than other places in the world or, or that, but uh, there were a lot of young children that died uh, either, either just a few months old, maybe a year old or, or even weeks old that, that would die. And I don't know if that was something that was 
something that, that was wrong with them, that they didn't get the medical attention they needed. Um, I can speak for myself. My arm is still crooked. I didn't get the medical attention I needed when I broke my arm. So, um, you know, they, they didn't, I mean, they had doctors and things out there, but I don't, I don't know that they were the state of the art type of doctor that you would hope for. So it could have just been, didn't have the medical attention they needed. And for that reason, they passed on. I'm not sure, but, um, but I do know that there were a lot of young children that did die. I'm, I'm reading from a uh, Reuters report that I just pulled up, and it says uh, twin border communities of Hilldale and Colorado City have the world's highest known prevalence of fumarous deficiency. It's an enzyme irregularity that causes severe mental retardation brought on by cousin marriage, and it goes through wow. to diagnose uh, all of that and what the what the uh, complication is and, and what the... Uh, what the numbers are, but uh, off the charts in that community compared to the rest of the world, which again, it's just one of those hard forensic facts that say that there was a problem and, right. uh, There's something and to be led, said there. whether it led to babies dying or, you know, at a higher rate than others, they suggest in the report, that's the case. But uh, you know, I'm I'm a just kind of a tired old cop, not a medical person. So <laughs> read that read that over. But and so the other thing that uh, we, and we spent. By the way, I want to just say in Willie's defense, uh, I stopped at one of his children's graves, one of his babies that was buried there, and I tried to get him to talk, and he got pretty emotional, and then he shut me down. And you both know, I mean, Willie's a big guy, and he's pretty pretty uh, um, direct. And uh, it was one of those uh, tender moments where I was able to see a little bit deeper into his soul that that made me want to just remember whenever I talk about this, not to get consumed with whether it was criminal in nature or something else, but that there was fa- there were families in that community that lost children that they deeply loved and they buried them there. And we can't we can't step away from that, whether it was because of, this deficiency that I just mentioned or because of bad childbearing or something else. I don't know, but it doesn't yeah. change the fact that they were deeply injured as human beings when they lost their children. So. And they weren't the ones who picked their partners either. That's an important thing to remember that, you know, they <laughs> aren't getting to choose true. whether or not they're marrying their first cousins. Very true. You know, they are told who they're going to marry. There's no courtship. There's no, um, yeah, they're not, oh, hey, this is my cousin. This isn't okay. That's not an option for them to to say no to or else they're leaving their entire community, their entire family, their entire lives. So they are getting married to whoever and don't have the education to even know that that would be a problem. Like, were you ever well, told? Like, did only, you know that? Not only, that it, not only education-wise, but just the, the fact that we assumed that every single marriage was divine revelation from God that that's who we should be with we just assume there's no way that he would put us put us with someone that would be that could cause problems that, like that, that that would cause problems so yeah, yeah I mean it just it, it was very much just once again not the people not was, the people it was the leaders that were forcing all of this yeah you, you know it reminds me of in, in my book deceived I talk about this but the children talked about how excited they were that they were chosen to go and have sex with the prophet because that meant that they were going to make their way back to God at a faster rate than somebody else, only to be horrified by the assault and uh, the things that happened after. And so it is a, uh, it is a goofy thing that children, as you well know, that live in, in uh, destructive cults (laughs) endure. And all the time you're fighting this amazing relationship you have with this huge family and the fun that you have and all of the community that you have, but it's all being orchestrated in an incredibly destructive way. How confusing. Yes, it is. And and, and being that that's all you know, I mean, it'd be one thing if we had lived a different life first and then experienced this, then we could, we could step outside the box and say, wait a minute. I've seen different ways to do this. This might be a better option, right? If that's all you know, you just feel and you're told that you're tremendously blessed to be given to a family that's uh, within the gospel and doing everything that God wants them to do. 
And uh, so you're, you're as happy as can be because you feel that as a child that you're the, the chosen one. You're the best. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's it, yeah, you're right. It's confusing. Definitely. Especially once you come out from it and then look back and think, wow. I mean, Amazing. they have me 100% convinced. Yeah. Now, it uh, the, the last thing I'm going to leave you is it took me eight hours to get there. And I hope people will go over to Profiling Evil and watch my uh, three-part series where I went back, the investigator returning 20 years later. <laughs> um, and I, I uh, did actually a couple of segments on that. But the last thing was it took me all day. The very first thing uh, I pressed Willie on was to go into the secret caves oh. and uh, it took the entire day until uh, just before I left, he took me and he actually invited uh, two of his children to come and they had never seen them. And uh, he, he indicated that probably 2% of the church ever knew that those existed and truly saw them uh, up until the time Warren was arrested. You know, those were very secretive. Uh, as a young boy, I was, uh, that, those caves weren't too far from my home growing up. So as we were playing around on the hills, around the community and that, uh, me and some of my brothers did happen upon the caves, but they were so barred up and locked up in chains. And <laughs> I mean, we were, we were wondering, what in the world is back there? Like we, we had no idea. We really wanted to go see but yeah, very secretive. Uh, we were, we had no idea though. We had, I, to, to this day, I've never been inside. Did, did you ever ask like your father or something what was in it? Or was it like you could tell from the look of it, like I'm not even going to ask? It was one of those things that, yes, we knew that it was something from the church. So we just assumed that it was uh, something to prepare us for whatever the case, a war maybe, or or to protect us from the from the evil outsiders, or we just assumed that it was something to help protect us because it was in the church's hands, and we thought that church had our best interests in mind and all of that. So I never asked any of the leaders. <laughs> so Mike, so what did Willie tell you? So what was in it? What, well, what so the the caves are amazing. They they uh, inside the caves are uh, two bathrooms with with a porcelain bathroom. Uh, uh, components, sinks, and toilets, and uh, there's a men's bathroom and a women's bathroom. There's a huge vault. Uh, the vault is uh, it was impenetrable. Uh, now is just wide open, but uh, it was a place where <laughs> explosives were stored, which were part of the ghost oh, stories that I wanted to know about. Uh, there were caches of weapons that were stored in the caves, and of course, a huge amount of food storage because it was not apocalyptic escape for the leadership of the church. And if you watch those videos at the end, uh, Willie was really uncomfortable about being on video of even near the caves. But at the end, <laughs> Willie videoed me with my iPhone talking about the caves inside the caves. Oh, so wow. he was filming me. So, I will link, I'll link those videos below in the description yes, so everyone amazing. can go straight to those videos because I want to see that I haven't even yeah. seen that video. We went, we went full circle and, uh, and I doubt Willie and I will ever, uh, have another lunch together, but it was, uh, <laughs> it was incredible. And, and to his defense, again, whether it's, uh, his own personal penance or for some other reason, he, uh, not only sued Warren and, and the church and got a bucket of money, but he's tried to do some good things in the community. And does that make up for all those years? I don't know. I'm going to leave that to somebody else to judge. But, uh, but what it did was it, it, those ghost stories that we chased for many years, I was able to finally put to rest. And so that was a, that was a pretty uh, incredible couple of days for me to spend out there in Colorado city, Hilldale. Wow. And to get some insight in some of the areas that most people will never get. So that's, uh, that's From pretty my, amazing. My former enemy, too. Yeah. I mean, think <laughs> yeah. about that. That's like pretty my wild. Rival. <laughs> wow. Well, that's pretty incredible. Um, did we want to end on the um, 
So there's just one last question we wanted to bring up before we let you go, if you have time. Sure. Just the most regarding the most recent revelation, or one of the most recent revelations from Warren Jeffs, uh, which we find very concerning. And we wanted to kind of bring it to you and see if you had any insight on the best way to go about informing people about this, uh, because it, it, it seems like it's hinting to mass suicide. Uh, in some sense or another. And uh, so it's, it's just very concerning for us. We've made a video on it, uh, but we're just trying to make sure that, that this type of thing doesn't actually happen. Yeah, we've had a lot of people ask, have you asked the authority or have you brought this up to authorities? And, um, you know, and we've been kind of pondering and trying to figure out what a good move is to bring this to authorities. And then we're like, we're going to be talking to Mike this weekend. We thought you were a good person to ask about that. And maybe you could share also with our viewers <coughs> a little bit of what the authorities can or can't do in a situation like this, where there is um, information that concerns people, the general public, what can they do? And then what can or can't authorities do when they hear about this? So in, in now um, 30 years of uh, following cult, destructive cult behaviors and looking at these kinds of things over and again, I watched, by the way, you, I thought you did a great job on your video. It was it yesterday or the day before where you talked about the revelations. And um, I would recommend everybody go back and watch those. It really becomes difficult to forecast what may or may not happen as a result of that, because this challenge of within five years in order to, to gain these highest kingdoms of exaltation, it becomes definitional into what death means. Is it death from all of the carnal world, or is it figuratively uh, something different, or is it very specifically your life comes to an end? Who knows? But exactly. you cannot, you cannot just treat these kinds of things, especially with someone who has proven time and time again that uh, revelation will come at the penalty of those who follow, like separation from family, being stripped of your children, having your spouse taken away being told you can't be intimate, uh, being told whether you can drink milk or not, all of those are past behaviors that could be predictive of future behaviors. And the best way over and again that cults maintain control and gain <coughs> members is through extremism, by asking you to do something that someone else wouldn't do because you're going to be blessed and confirmed to receive exaltation or special blessings or special dispensation. So I would suspect that local authorities already have heard about this, but I would not suggest in any way that you do nothing. I would make sure you send an email to the attorney general, to the field office in St. George of the FBI, to the Washington County Sheriff's Office, just to kind of clean your own hands of a piece of information that you heard about that they probably already know about. And what can they do? Probably nothing. They can try to talk to a community, just like we did in the early 90s when we said through Safe at Home, Sam, if you ever had a problem or if you saw something uncomfortable, you can call us. We're going to help you. Well, nobody called. Nobody believed, and nobody was going to risk exaltation by calling the police. And so will those who are deeply embedded uh, make that call? Probably not. Will those who are on a fence maybe think, this is one more time that I've heard about wackiness, and it's time for me to get out. And so that's why <laughs> transparency is so darn important. And destructive cults do not believe in transparency. They believe in secrecy. Oh, yeah. Call it sacred. Call it whatever you want. It's secrecy. And transparency is uh, the only thing that's going to help in situations like this. And I'll tell you, I look at mainstream religion. I look at the Latter-day Saint faith. And people, again, like to hammer the Latter-day Saint faith. Um, 
there's a big difference between people who preach that you look heavenward toward a loving God of some kind, whether it's you know uh, a, a Muslim's belief or a Jewish belief of who God is, a Christian belief of a Trinity, uh, or the Buddhist belief of of worshiping a big gold statue and, and a man who walked the earth. There's a big difference between pointing eyes heavenward and pointing eyes toward a leader who's sitting in a prison in Texas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, we'll definitely be following Mike's advice um, and definitely reaching out to those authorities. So for those of you who are watching, <laughs> um, we'll definitely be making those phone calls and trying to do our part. And for those of you who are watching that maybe. Um, are on the fence or in the process of leaving or transitioning. Um, again, our information, please reach out to us. We are more than happy to help in any way. We also will have the information for Holding Out Help. Um, they are an awesome organization in Utah to help people transitioning and leaving polygamy. And they have helped a lot. And they have helped so many people, people that we personally know that they have helped um, be able to gain educations or jobs or so many different resources to be able to help get on your own feet and that is what our cause is for our Christmas donation that you can donate below is for holding out help this month as well. So just wanted to shout that out again um, for anybody who's watching, because sometimes we feel like, OK, you know, this is um, just informational for people on the outside. But we've had more and more people reach out to us who have either recently left or um, even some people that have been on the inside that are still just kind of peeking at the outside world. And we want you to know that. We are here for you, and there's a whole community of people who want you to be safe. Yes, yes. Thank so. you. And thank you, Mike. We really appreciate you being here with us today. Uh, such an uh, interesting perspective you have uh, coming from the outside, looking in and, and helping the, helping do your part the best you could. I'm sorry I probably treated you like garbage when you, when you were out there, but... Uh, <laughs> I was a young kid in those nah, days. No, you were, yeah, you were one of those <laughs> dirty faced little boys that just ran away. So. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> but we appreciate you. We appreciate all the work that you've done to try to help the community and that you continue to do in helping people understand more about these communities and understand that it's the leaders, not the people. So we appreciate the work you do so much. Yes. No, thank you. And thanks for what you're doing to get this word out. You guys are so much fun to be with. Thanks again. Thanks thank so you. Much. We'll talk to you all we'll talk soon. To you soon.